Wow. Um, thank you, Lucy, and lovely to see all of you. Thank you very much for uh, welcoming me here at Christchurch Art Gallery. Um, I've had this amazing voyage around New Zealand in, in the last week or so, and, and I've met some really, really inspiring people. So in some ways, I'm, I'm here to learn uh, from you as much as, as I hope I have some interesting things uh, to bring you from, uh, from my experience around the UK. I also know some of you have travelled uh, up to 200 miles uh, to come and see me today. So, uh, wow. And uh, I really hope I do justice to that. So what uh, I thought we might do today is a little bit of this, uh, some postcards uh, from museums around the world. Just take a look at what's happening out there, what's going on, some of the, the trends and things that we see uh, emerging. And then I've got some questions. I've got some things that I'd like to, to share with you, some ideas and some thoughts, but also some questions about uh, where you see things going. And, and I've been fed a series of questions by the team here about things that it might be interesting to talk about. So does that sound like a useful way to spend maybe an hour of your lives? Jolly good. OK, let's go ahead and do that. Does anybody know where this is? The British Museum, splendid. So it's the Great Court, uh, the British Museum. I thought we'd start there um, with the familiar. Now, this um, is a, an exhibition that was at the Science Museum in London uh, last year, and I thought I'd start with a quote from two of your countrymen, Flight of the Concords. Uh, affirmative, I poked one, it was dead. This was an exhibition uh, which brought the latest cutting edge in robotics face to face with people so that people could interact, could learn, uh, could see where robots were going. And it was a real challenge um, for a lot of uh, people within the museum to start to see the museum as a, a place where people could have that kind of uh, experience, that kind of interaction. And a number of people questioned whether this was a function of a museum. And that's a theme that I'm going to come back to time and time again, that old chestnut. This one, I just think, is the best form of marketing I've ever seen. Uh, this was from, uh, there was a show uh, the Welcome Collection. It was quite a, an ordinary show, in fact. It was about skin and the fact that we all have skin and what a kind of human collective experience that is. And there weren't really a lot of people coming until they put this sign <laughs> outside the exhibition. Visitors may find material displayed in the curtained area disturbing. I mean, wouldn't you go into a show that said that? And in indeed, they did. They flocked in. This one, um, more recently at the Vancouver Paralympics, uh, is an exhibition called Out From Under where what they tried to do with youth uh, museum collections. Did anybody see this one? Has anybody been to this one? No. OK. So they were using, that's just checking so I can say anything I like about it now. Um, but they were using collections to explore themes about disability and identity there in the middle of this sporting uh, festival and this celebration of Paralympic achievement, uh, asking some very difficult questions, which, as we know, museums are the ideal place to do without getting punched hard in the face. Um, about identity and representation and rights and disability uh, and, and mainstream culture. This then uh, is still a dream, it's a design, um, but it's the design for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Shenzhen, um, where really what they're trying to do is, is this idea of the museum that becomes porous, the idea that life flows through the museum, into the museum, out of the museum, that it's a social space that interesting ideas around architecture and flow and urban design and urban planning uh, meet the function of the museum. And it's interesting to look at a place like where we are today, the, um, the whole area, the whole geography of this quarter that we're in, and look at the way people flow around what is a very functional, uh, multicultural uh, space, a very multifunctional space. So starting to look at the ways in which museums through design, through the idiom of architecture, are becoming a different kind of experience uh, for people and, and renegotiating in some ways the expectations that people bring to museums. Has anybody been here? Anybody here been lucky enough to go to Doha? I haven't either. Um, but this is the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, which is really trying to do a number of things. It's a celebration uh, of the wealth, the richness of Islamic art, but it's also an exploration of Islamic faith, Islamic identity, the Islamic diaspora and the Muslim diaspora around the world. And it's also just a staggering place. At sunset, um, it turns golden, and it floats as a sort of golden island. But there's also some very challenging things happening with this. Uh, this less of an example, but many museums in the Middle East being used as a, a, a status symbol, used as a way of renegotiating and re-identifying things like family history, um, tribal history. And so museums as a, an expression and an assertion of cultural rights and entitlement, um, where I think one of the most interesting interfaces is in terms of 
museums being used to project a particular form of cultural identity, a particular interpretation uh, of the world. So it's kind of museum as propaganda as well as museum as exploration of identity and, uh, and of faith. This, uh, I don't know if anybody's played with this one, but this is the uh, war table at the Cabinet War Rooms in London. Has anybody seen this one? Has anybody had a play with this one? It's a marvellous, marvellous thing. Essentially an interactive table. It's a social experience. It's a way of exploring uh, all of the rich information in the archives around the Cabinet War Rooms. But also it's fun. It's playful. When you hit on the right date, uh, little events happen. So when you hit on the correct date, uh, the Dam Buster bomber flies as a silhouette to the whole length of the table with a, an oral soundscape and drops a little bomb about halfway along and the bomb bounces and then it bounces and then it explodes in a shower of noise. And it's about the fact that museums are social, they're collaborative, they're, they're playful. But also, critically, and, and a theme that I'll, I'll come back to more in, in this talk, it's about technology enriching the experience. It's not about the technology. It doesn't matter how they did it. It matters that they did it and that people uh, can experience it. The next one, uh, this is uh, a personal favorite of mine, is a, a museum called 826 Valencia. Mm -hmm. Has anybody come across this? I'm just going to stop asking. Put your hand up if you've seen it. Um, but this is in, in San Francisco. And it's a, it's a kind of museum by stealth. Uh, so this is a pirate shop. It's a shop for kids. And their um, mission statement for the museum, I just think all mission statements for museums should look like this, is plunder, meet new people, and learn valuable new skills, uh, which I think is incredibly worthy but the point is that this presents itself to the world as a shop as a retail space but if you go through the back in the far right under the skull and crossbones flag you emerge into uh, a museum space you emerge into this very rich very uh, multifunctional experience and the point I'm trying to make with all of this is that museums are a very very broad church museums can be all of these things. And the idiom of what a museum is has expanded beyond all measure in the last decade so that people come to museums with a playful expectation, with a different kind of understanding of what it is uh, that they're looking at. And we've had some very interesting discussions on, on this journey around New Zealand about what is a museum, what isn't a museum, should a museum be a place with display cabinets and stuff, or can they be uh, something like this, or does this turn the museum idea into a theme park? Is this pushing the boundaries too far? And uh, I'll leave you to make your own decisions, and perhaps we can have a discussion about that. But museums all over the world are coming to mean something much richer and more experiential and playful than they did maybe 20, 30 years ago. This is an interesting example of a new phenomenon that's emerging uh, around the Far East. This is an example in, in Bangkok. Um, but they're creating things called creative cities. And the assertion is that a strong culture, a strong uh, culture of creativity and innovation is good for business. It drives innovation, it drives commercial productivity, it drives more confident citizens. And so there's incredibly active investment in culture as a part of economic infrastructure throughout the Far East. You're seeing places like this which combine the features of libraries, of museums, of galleries, of exhibition spaces. And the proposition is that the money is good for business, the money is good for uh, national economies and for driving economic growth, which I think is a lesson that we could all stand to learn um, around the rest of the world. Certainly I could in the UK, given the events of recent weeks. This one it's incredibly hard to do a picture of because it doesn't really uh, exist, but this is something called the Chicago Underground Library. And what the Chicago Underground Library does is it's, it's about guerrilla collecting. It's about people coming together around different ideas of collections, things that they want to collect. Uh, and then it's an exhibition space that the community fills with uh, the things that it wants to collect, the things that it thinks are important. And the point about a lot of this stuff is that in the general psyche about museums, you need an experience, you need value, you need curatorship, you need all of those very solid, very tangible things. But you can also play with those concepts, and you can play with those concepts in a way that people fundamentally understand. People get the idiom uh, of what it is that we're doing. This one, uh, further closer to home, is uh, a, a website uh, called Culture Label. And what Culture Label is all about is about bringing the essence of museumness, the ideas that people have in their head when they think about the word museum, um, to interact with uh, big name brands, to interact with clothing brands, with tourism brands, electronics brands. And so what we have here are a series of products, high-end products, 
that are co-created between museums and companies like uh, Puma uh, or Adidas or big fashion labels. And so you have this idea that culture drives uh, creative research and development, that drives economic activity. You have this idea that you can bring the value proposition of museums, the thing that people have in their mind when you say the word museum, has a tremendous value, and you bring that into a commercial space. And a lot of the, the challenges that we've had, a lot of the discussions we've had, are about whether we're um, selling off museums, whether we're dumbing down, whether we're belittling the identity, trust, and authority that goes with that word uh, by engaging with the commercial environment in this way. But it's driving a tremendous amount of revenue into museums. And so we're going beyond the idea of the museum shop and into something that's about co-creation of new products. It's about development of new lines. It's about research um, and innovation. And behind a lot of this, there's a, an interesting example I haven't, I don't think, got a slide of, um, where there's a, a fashion company, a retail company in the UK called Marks & Spencers uh, that has a company archive. And the Marks & Spencers um, archive goes back sort of over 100 years, but they revisited uh, the archive essentially to do some textile research. Uh, but what they found was a company policy from about 64, 65 on wastage, on how to reduce the amount of cloth that they were wasting in producing their products. So they reapplied it today, and they saved about 18 to 20 percent uh, of their overheads on wastage of, of new product. And so part of the idea uh, of what we're experiencing in terms of museums all over the world is this coming together of the, of the past, the present, the future, this idea that heritage drives present identity, drives future uh, development and creativity. The next example uh, is one that I haven't really got a decent picture of, but this is a thing called the Living Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina, <coughs> which is a kind of socially owned, uh, collectively owned, mutualized uh, cultural space. But it combines everything from uh, a television and recording studio, it has a community press office for fighting uh, social campaigns, it has a museum, it has a gallery, it has an entertainment space. It's an incredibly rich, multifunctional space that's owned by uh, the community and that's kind of co-curated by the community. And again, my assertion would be that museums can be all of these things and many, many more without fundamentally undermining the public trust in what it is uh, that we do, that I think people get the rules uh, and they understand that when we play with the rules, it doesn't critically undermine the idiom of what we're doing. The next series of slides um, are from uh, an exhibition. Did anybody hear about this uh, Banksy exhibition at uh, Bristol? And so Banksy is a graffiti artist in the UK, and he likes to be playful with the idea of museology. He likes to take the, the language and idiom of, of museology and, and kind of expropriate it and have fun with it. Um, and this is the, um, the poster, the, the kind of leading image from a, a show called Exit Through the Gift Shop, where he really kind of played with a lot of those concepts. This is one of my all-time uh, favorite pieces of work. So tired she's got of toiling in the fields that she's taking a quick fag break before she returns uh, to work. But just being um, serendipitous, being playful, having fun with those ideas. This one um, is arguably my favorite uh, thing in a museum. Banksy created um, this as a piece of, of kind of skunk um, cave art, and then he put it into uh, the Natural History Museum. He kind of put it onto a wall uh, outside, and then he filmed it. And what was really interesting, he wanted to see how long it would take before somebody noticed and took it out of the museum as being inappropriate. And what's interesting is you've got a lot of people who are heads down, you've got a lot of fed up mums, and you've got a lot of screaming kids, and you've got a lot of dads who don't really want to be there. And when they see something fun and playful and unexpected in the museum space, they lift. Uh, they lift their eyes up, they think again, they look again, they laugh, and they socialize, and they point. Um, and it's fun. And then there's a wonderful video of the incredibly annoyed security guard seeing it and getting all gruff and pissed off and taking it off the walls. Um, but it's that idea of playing with the museum concept. And again, the idea that being playful, because we can own what museums are, we own the destiny of museums, we own the definition of museums. If we play with that, people get the rules. So the wonderful thing about the Banksy show is that it transformed the visitor figures for Bristol. Bristol wasn't, it's not a mainstream gallery, it's a popular um, gallery, but you had queues of up to three or four hours uh, for people wanting to come and see that thing. And what that did is, yes, it was a big showy blockbuster, and so yes, it was kind of out with the normal behavior of the museum, but it told more people about what museums can be. It drew more people into uh, that conversation, which ultimately I think people uh, have a very profound and a very important right uh, to enjoy. 
This one um, is the Trouw building in Amsterdam. Uh, and Trouw was a local newspaper, a local Dutch newspaper. It was a Dutch daily. Um, and because of print production, because of digital uh, press, it moved out of this magnificent uh, old press room. So this was the original printing press room for um, their newspaper. And so from the, uh, the cadaver of old media, from the world of, of newspapers, has grown this incredibly playful digital uh, cultural space in which you have exhibitions, you have events, you have a bar here at the end with a nightclub, this guy doing whatever he's doing with his, his wireless. But the point about taking the shell of heritage, that, that kind of structure of what went before, and being playful with it, putting new ideas and growing uh, new, <laughs> new models around it. This one, I don't know if anybody had uh, the pleasure of going to this at the Tate Gallery. It's in the Turbine Hall of Tate Modern. It's this great cathedral-like um, space. And this is a, a work called The Light at the End of the Tunnel by Oliar Eliasson. And it's the sun, obviously enough. It's the sun. What you can't see, though, is that here in the foreground of the picture is a tremendous slope that goes down from the entrance of the museum. And so what you first see when you come to the doors of the museum is this extraordinary, surreal sunset in the middle of this space. And then people were worshipping. People would lie down on the slope in the middle of this museum space, in the middle of this modern art space, and would worship the sun, would kind of soak up and have this very primal uh, and social experience. He did cheat a bit. There's actually only half of it is a light bulb. The rest of it is a, a mirrored ceiling. But the idea of, of museums as a kind of transformative uh, and social experience. This one uh, is something that we're finding more and more. More people don't come into museums than do. Let, let's start there. That the majority of people don't. Um, and that's a shame. And I think they should. And I think we probably all think they should. And so one of the questions is about whether we should... Uh, ask people to come to museums or whether we should take museums to people. And so this is a phenomenon that we're seeing more and more of is the pop-up museum. In this case, it was a pop-up museum created by a company called Stretch uh, in a central shopping centre in Leeds. Um, and what they did is very simple. They brought collections from the museum into this empty, uh, abandoned retail space. They created zones uh, with different types of collection. They had gallery staff uh, on hand to explain the things that people were looking at. And because it was fun, because it was funny, because it was playful, because it was unexpected, those people who wouldn't normally walk through the doors of a museum walked through the doors of a pop-up museum. And it started to get us through this thing, which I'll come on and talk about in a minute, which is this three visits in a lifetime problem that I've, I've spoken, I know, already to a number of people about, that people go to a museum when they're a child, they go to a museum when they have children, they go to a museum when they have grandchildren. And that actually that's not good enough. That what we should be doing is building a lifelong relationship with those people so that they come back. Um, and that the majority of people do come to museums rather than the majority of people don't. So museums are and can be all of these things and more. And we could stop there and probably have a really interesting uh, conversation about where this fits in terms of your model of, of museology. And I'm sure everybody would say, yes, it's a celebration. We can be all of these things to all of these people. But then you will go back to your institution and not be many of these things. And it's interesting to ask yourselves, I guess, why. But museums can be, at the same time, playful, serious, creative. It doesn't have to be uh, this incredibly orthodox, authoritative experience and that in many ways uh, the best way to engage people is to play with the idiom of museology is to have fun with the ideas so these are incredible places this is where I kind of stand up and say incredibly glib things that you know already but what's fascinating not just in terms of my meetings with with you in New Zealand but all over the world and that is really my job is I get to travel around and meet people all over the world uh, who work in museums um, that people very often forget that People very often forget what an absolutely extraordinary privilege it is to work in these places with these astonishing collections, that people spend 20 years with their heads down fighting battles and worrying about money, and that actually sometimes it's important just to look up and think, this is, what an amazing thing to do, what an extraordinary thing to be able to do with your life. And museums are filled with people like you, extraordinary people uh, who are willing to work for not very much money. Um, but who do all of these extraordinary things, who come into work, who, who weather those political battles and battles who get on with it, because I believe you have a fundamental belief in the very, very real, very important thing that happens when somebody stands in front of something that they could never have seen anywhere else, have never seen any, anywhere else, 
and are transformed by it. That today, there are people out there outside that door who will leave this building changed forever as a result of what we do for a living. And sometimes that is the thing that we should spend a little bit more time focusing on uh, rather than whether we're going to be able to fund our next exhibition. And so these incredible people, you in these incredible places, are doing all of these incredible and playful things. We're having fun. We're creating new ideas. Um, we're entertaining and educating and inspiring and changing people. And that's an extremely important thing to do in the world. There is nowhere else in the world like a museum. Nobody else does this. It's not education. It's not the telly. It's something very, very important and very, very unique. So I'm often asked, um, and so I'm going to pretend that I've been asked today, what business do you think museums in, are in? Are we in the experience business? Are we in education? Are we in academic research? And so I've got a whole set of answers. And the first one is that I believe that. I think that fundamentally we're in the joy business. I think we're in the business of creating those moments of transformation, of euphoria, of surprise, of excitement, all of those things that normal human beings out there, now we shut them out, but that's all right, they won't come in. Um, normal human beings out there get out of this. And I don't know how joyful it is sometimes working in a museum. It doesn't always feel joyful. Sometimes it feels annoying and depressing and all of those things. But fundamentally, we're in the business of creating great joy. And I think we should be proud of that. We're also in this business. We're in the business of holding a mirror up to society. We're in the business of showing people where they're going wrong. We're in the business of showing society that where you get things like this, moments of destruction, Hiroshima, it's because people devalue one another. They dehumanize one another. They devalue each other's cultures. And if we can share culture, and if we can share intercultural understanding and dialogue, this kind of thing happens less. The idiots don't win because it's a result of what we do. We show the world itself. And all of those principles about the unexamined life is not worth living. You know, what we do is we help people examine life so that it has some meaning and some value. We're in the business of confronting some of the most difficult issues that society has to face. Issues of racism, of faith, of identity, of, of how people work together and how they respect one another and live in harmony with one another. And there's a really, really profound ethical uh, challenge in museums about who gets a voice, whose voice are we telling, whose story are we telling. I know that here biculturalism is the issue, in other countries it's multiculturalism, in some other countries it's the state controlling the message about what culture means in their nation. And so sometimes the best thing that museums can simply do is hold that mirror up to life and confront society with itself uh, and show people what uh, the basic rules of respect Ah, oh, I also just love that picture. We're in the business of that face right there, that happy, smiling, mental, slightly worrying child having an extraordinary time in a ridiculous way, in a, in a fun, in a playful, in a safe, in a social, uh, in a mediated, in a curated environment. That's an extraordinary business to be in, that face right there, because we're in the business of fun. And we mustn't forget that. We mustn't ever forget that this is partly not about worthiness. It's not about education. It's not about social outcomes. It's about fun. And it's about making more of that face as a result of our work. We do this. We do a tremendous amount of work driving creativity. No creativity comes from nowhere. I'm, I'm a, a painter by training. I, I trained as a fine artist. And the first thing you do is go and learn. You go and draw, you go and sketch, you go and learn from the masters. And so we help people stand on the shoulders of giants, learn from what went before them, and create new things and new worlds. That photo is uh, from a competition between YouTube and a number of museums in the US, where people took the collections and started journeys with them, took films, made, made movies, um, narratives, stories, histories, mythologies, uh, that started with that very simple thing of an object. Uh, in a collection. And we do that. We enable people uh, to create those moments. We're in this business. That um, is the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery will be familiar, I'm sure, to Leslie. But uh, the, uh, the thing that they're all filing through is the kind of rotunda. It's the round room with um, the kind of various paintings. But that queue, you can't see it, but that queue comes kind of back round here and down here into the front door and out into the... And it was, a, it was their longest ever. It's kind of two hours worth of queuing. And at the end of that corridor is um, a thing called the Staffordshire Horde. There's a wonderful story to the Staffordshire Horde. Has anybody heard the story of the Staffordshire Horde? 
Okay, so there was uh, this guy, metal detectorist, never metal detected before, and he bought a, a metal detector, and he got in his car, and he drove to a field, and uh, he got out of his car, and he was standing there, thought he'd better test the battery, so he turned the metal detector on and discovered the richest collection of Anglo-Saxon gold artifacts we've ever known uh, in our country, I think. And, um, and he said it's ruined metal detectoring for him forevermore, because he can never do it again, because basically it's never going to get that good. Um, but we're in the business of, of bringing people in, of tourism, of driving local economies, of driving travel and, and all of those things. And we're in that business of all of those people coming there with excitement and expectation and traveling long distances to have those experiences. We're in this, increasingly, the business of games. That's an augmented uh, reality game where objects emerge out of the, the visible world at you and you play and, and interact with them. But we're in the business of enabling people to play with their environment, to reinterpret their context and, and renegotiate the rules of the game a little bit um, by understanding more about the world around them. So museums are these incredible places. This is where I'm going to bring it down a notch here. But uh, apparently I said I was going to be slightly provocative and you said you could handle provocation. So we'll do that. But there's so much left to do. We can do all of those things. We can be all of those things. We can deliver all of that incredible stuff. But a lot of our behaviors, a lot of our values, a lot of the way we do museums um, are holding us back, are stopping us from doing all of that stuff. So I just wanted to talk about some of those things that maybe uh, are holding us back. This is a wonderful moment of tension, shall I? Right. Um, more people don't use museums than do. We have to confront that fact that of the 6.7 billion people on the planet, far more don't come in. And I want to know why. Because I think uh, in a stable, in a democratic, in a free, in an open society, the right to see history, the right to engage with your cultural heritage, and the right to visit a library, the right to learn from the knowledge that went before you, is one of the most fundamental human rights uh, there is. And so why aren't they coming? Because it isn't a marketing challenge. It's a fundamental value proposition challenge. Why are those people standing in front? Because they're open, they're here, everybody knows we're there. And there's a perception that's maybe 20, 30 years out of date for many people, that museums aren't for the likes of them, that we're not there uh, for them, that they don't have rights and ownership. And one of my saddest stories about um, standing in front of a museum, standing in front of a museum in Leicester, um, and there was a mother and her son, kind of young boy, and the son said, can we go in? And the mother said, I don't think we're allowed. And I think there's too many people in the world that don't feel they're allowed to do this. And we have to recognize that this idiom, this world of museums that we're so very comfortable with is a very weird thing. It's a very stylized and a very alien and a very culturally pejorative thing. And so we have to ask ourselves why that majority of people aren't walking through the doors. We have to break this somehow, we really do. Um, that people, and there's other research that we've done which is immensely frustrating where we say to people kind of, you know, what do you think about museums? What's your attitudes and values around them? And they say, well, I think museums are incredibly important, but I don't go to them. And that's something we hear everywhere in, in every part of the world. So we have to break that model and we have to try and understand what that means. Yes, there's validity to the school group. Yes, there's validity to spending a day out mucking around with the kids. But this should be something that people own, that they take, that they make their own, that forms a part of uh, people's daily lives. We're closed when people are open. It's a very simple proposition. Uh, but we open our doors when people go to work and we close them again when they come out. It's a very strange thing to do, uh, that we're basically not there, not available. And I know about rotors and I know about uh, gallery staff and I know about security. Um, but there's a very interesting question about if we really mean this, if our primary function is to deliver all of those things for people and for society, then we have to question uh, our approach to how we engage with people on their own terms uh, rather than on our terms. If, on the other hand, that this all, all of those wonderful outcomes are but a thin veneer over the fact that we like collecting stuff and looking after it, then maybe we should confront that one uh, and be honest about that one. But there's something very odd about the way in which museums fit into the working lives of normal people. This is extremely important. Having presided in the UK over around £230 million worth of investment in putting content online, um, it's no kind of substitute. It doesn't work to have that kind of rich uh, experiential experience standing in front of a real tangible thing and being transformed by it. You can't replace that with a light box, with a, a collections browse, with a, a kind of online grocery shopping style experience of collections. And there are some very odd 
things around that whole expectation that if you put it online, if you build it, people will come and they'll have valuable experiences because they won't. And in a way, rather than spending all of that money and time, that 230 million, on covering everything, on digitizing absolutely everything, I would rather have digitized a smaller number of things that drew people in, that were more richly described, that had more narrative around them, that were delivered through the channels that people use in their daily lives, uh, and drawn more people in to have that very, very important, uh, tangible experience. Because that is a fundamental truth, that if you digitize things without a way of getting it to your audience, and by that I do not mean your museum's website, if you digitize things without getting to a real audience, the billions of people that are online, the people that are using Flickr, Wikipedia, Google, services that are mainstream, that are consumer, that are rich, um, then it's worse than building a museum with no doors. And one of the things that's very odd about our attitude to digital is that we got fascinated, we got startled by the glamour of it and suddenly decided it was somehow different. Um, but it's not, it's another kind of collection. And all of the knowledge, all of those skills, all of the attitudes and values that we had when we were collecting physical artifacts are exactly the same attitudes and values that we need to bring to this digital uh, value proposition. And so at the NDF, I think I was quoted as saying, if you digitize something and you don't know what it's for, I'll kill you. I'm slightly regretting that being my soundbite. But um, we have to stop, and I don't know actually if you've started over here, but if you haven't started, I urge you not to throwing money at digitization as though it was somehow simpler or easier or more valuable or, or that it created value in its own right, when ultimately digitizing more things and putting them on your museum's website does not lead to access or value. We've got to break that chain of thinking that says if you put it up there, they will come because they don't and we don't have the reach and we're in a way doing exactly the thing that we regret doing about collecting too much stuff in the 70s and 80s without having a sufficient delivery vector for it all. Copyright is so not that. And I am so tired. I've spent 13 years fighting people over copyright. Copyright is an incredibly simple piece of legislation. It has a very simple purpose. It's become complicated because it's a moral right and an economic tradable good. But ultimately, in museums, copyright has become this, this barrier, this, this default position, this reason why we can't do things. And that's not good enough. We, for all of the legal advice, for all of the legal fighting, it's not our war. The war that's being waged over copyright is a war around music. It's a war around film. It's a war around industries and economies that are far larger than ours. And all of the advice that we've had from international lawyers all over the world is that we shouldn't be fighting on the field of copyright. We should be fighting on the field of human rights. That if you can stand up in front of a jury of your peers and justify your actions in terms of reproducing something to create cultural value and to provide access to it, then you're satisfying a fundamental human right. And we have to get over using this copyright barrier because we've exacerbated the problem. Copyright, nine times out of 10, when I work with museums, means I don't want to. And that's not good enough. And we can't do it anymore. Because essentially, what we're doing is by using that copyright word as an impediment, we're preventing ourselves from using exactly those channels that would enable museums to reach a truly global audience. We're holding ourselves back from reaching those billions of people through Wikipedia and, and Flickr. And it's silly. And we've got to stop doing it. So has everybody agreed? Fine. We're just going to move on from copyright. But there's a profound discomfort about the way we behave towards this stuff because the other thing we've got to stop doing is acquiring material without collecting enough information about it to own it properly. You wouldn't, I hope, in your museum, acquire an object without acquiring title to it or at least clarifying the title. You wouldn't acquire an object without knowing what the donor's wishes were. So why are you acquiring objects without knowing what the copyright status is? Because it's happening every day that museums are creating new orphans, new works in their collections. And if we're really going to use this material to reach out to all of those audiences, then we have to stop uh, failing to, to collect that information about ownership. The other questions, I guess, um, that I just wanted to say a few words about. This one is extremely important. This is a massive building with a big glass wall at the front. That costs a lot to stabilize in environmental terms. There's big fans I'm willing to bet on the roof. Um, you're spending a lot of money on active monitoring, on thermohygrographs, on looking at relative humidity. You're looking at controlling light. All of that is this incredibly 
environmentally expensive process. And museums in the business of retarding the processes of time and decay have to recognize that we're very environmentally costly and compounded by the fact that part of our business is tourism, that we're encouraging people to travel. I traveled here by airplane. Uh, travel by uh, travel large distances in order to see and enjoy these collections. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. What I'm saying is that we have a twin obligation, uh, a three-part obligation possibly. Um, the first one of which is really to investigate passive environmental control, to stop thinking that we have to heat, light, ventilate, and fire control every single thing in collections, to look at passive monitoring, passive control of collections. The second one is to help people understand the environmental cost, is to help the public understand what it takes, because the vast majority of the work of environmental control uh, in these institutions is kind of unseen. And then the third element is to understand within our calculus of cultural value, within our ideas around return, of in, return on investment and, and cost, we have to be able to calculate that environmental cost. We have to take it seriously because we're one of those industries, obviously much smaller than manufacturing or, or industry or, or logistics, but we do have a considerable environmental impact and we have a duty to behave responsibly towards that. This issue, which I think um, goes right to the heart for me, uh, to the ideas of representation of, of significance of rights, that for a very long time, and we still need to place um, the, the idiom, museums were about that voice of orthodoxy and authority, that the curatorial voice, the rich, knowledgeable, and learned interpretation of collections was the only voice. And I'm not saying that that isn't the primal voice. That's a big part of the public trust in what we do. But we have to find ways of welcoming many voices into the process of interpreting collections, but also the processes of managing these institutions. Now, I know this is kind of Coles to Newcastle, because in New Zealand, you've got this long and, and rich history of biculturalism, which I think um, is all fine, and you've solved all the problems, right? And it's kind of the impression that I'm given. But this idea that it isn't just us, and I think about things like disposal. How do you make decisions about what to get rid of? If we've got too much stuff and we need to be environmentally responsible, that means disposing. Too often in museums, that's a, a one-way street that we make decisions that are curatorially motivated when, in fact, there are rich voices teeming uh, around that stuff which have an equal say in whether something's culturally significant, whether it should be disposed, what should happen to it. And this idea of stories that the thing that turns an object, that turns your Singer sewing machine into a, a cultural artifact, into an experience, are the stories that are created around it. That's the whole point. And so in some ways, not finding ways of welcoming stories from outside, not finding ways of becoming like the museum in Shenzhen, porous, uh, to allowing stories to flow out and in and through uh, the museum, is closing off a large part of our cultural value. And for so many of us, our systems won't store them, or we don't know where to put them, or we don't have ways of valuing the user voice that comes in. So we have to start to find ways of recognizing that this isn't a, a monodirectional relationship that we have with users, but it's dialectic, it's a dialogue, it's a conversation that we have with people who are enjoying culture. Museums work best when they work as a coherent unit. I don't know what your backgrounds are here, but what I find fascinating is, is, this, um, is this divergence between different museum functions, even within very small museums. And I, I said this morning to the good folks at Canterbury Museum that I had a dream, and I do still have a dream, and the dream is that four people would come together and they would be a senior manager, an education officer, a front of house gallery assistant, and the documentation officer in the museum, and each of them would understand, respect, value the work of the other, because too often in museums there are these silos. There's knowledge that's generated by a volunteer, by a researcher, by somebody working to create an education pack that doesn't become part of that very vital, very vivid uh, collection of knowledge that's really what powers um, that very important experience that people have in museums. And so too often it's teams and it's divisions and it's departments and it's sites and we split ourselves off from a large part of the value of what we've got. And so we have to find ways of bringing together uh, and reinvigorating those conversations across departments. This one, I think I was asked to say a word about how would you get people to re-engage and get kind of reinvigorated about collections. And the only answer I have, I don't have answers to all of these questions, is that one, is that you are human beings too. 
um, that sometimes it's important to look up. And events like this are an opportunity to look up. But creating opportunities, breaking the chain, breaking the cycle of behavior, and taking time to walk into your galleries. One of the richest experiences I have um, in UK museums, I have a friend called David Fleming who came here a little while ago who runs Liverpool Museum. And he and I will go and stand uh, in the foyer of his museum. He's a museum director, he's a busy guy. Um, but we stand in the foyer of his museum and we see people having that transformative experience. We see kids learning more about the world, collaborating, colliding quite often. Um, we see people having fun and playing in that space. And I don't know when the last time was that you stood in the foyer of your museum and enjoyed your museum. I don't know when the last time was that you looked up and stopped thinking about the problems and the administration and the teams and the, all of the thousand worries that each working day in a museum is heir to and just enjoyed this extraordinary privilege, this joyful thing um, that we're all engaged in the business of. So I recommend that you stop listening to people like me and just go out there and enjoy uh, your museum. But I did, I mean, Leslie, we spent time in your museum and your joy was tangible and I think it's so important to get connected um, to that stuff. So I really would bring, I guess, things to a close. I have no idea how much time has elapsed, but there you go, it's one of those. Um, by saying these things again, these places are incredible, they're unique, they're transformative. They do something so important for society, it can't be stated and restated often enough. You are incredible people. What you do, what you put up with, what you achieve, what you imagine, what you create, is incredible and you should be proud of it and we should celebrate it because it's important. And you're doing these incredible, extraordinary, playful things in museums. And museums can burst, can accommodate, can welcome all of that ingenuity and all of that creativity precisely because of that very rare and very unique thing that we are. So that's everything I wanted to say to you today. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope some of that has been interesting or, or thought-provoking. And I'd really welcome any questions, observations, or, or comments you have. Thank you very much for listening.